What do art and philosophy have in common? Well, we'll start negatively. They, I hold that they have, are forms of cognition that are not forms of knowledge. What is knowledge? Well, I can't answer that question today, but I can say that I think there are two kinds of knowledge. I say that all knowledge breaks down into one of two sorts. Uh, the, you can either, if somebody asks you what something is, you can either tell them what it, it's made of, or you can tell them what it does. I challenge you to find any kind of knowledge that does not fit one of those two categories. That's what knowledge is. Usually one of those two things are both in combination. So if somebody asks me what water is, you know, assuming someone doesn't know what it is, I can either tell them the chemical composition, I can tell them the history of how it came about on the earth, if I happen to know that, or I can also tell them all the various ways in which it is used. Uh, that uh, uh, it can be used to quench one's thirst, that it can be used to put out fires. Those are the two sorts of knowledge that exist, and they both amount to forms of reduction. In the one case, you're reducing the water downward to hydrogen and oxygen in a certain combination. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing, because we need to do that. We need this kind of chemical knowledge to progress as a species and to survive. So I'm not denouncing knowledge. I'm just saying there's something that knowledge doesn't cover in human cognition. Uh, what's wrong with reducing a thing downward or undermining it? as I say in object-oriented ontology. Undermining means reducing a thing to what's beneath it. What's wrong with that is that it cannot account for what we call emergence, because obviously if you uh, uh, take the properties of hydrogen and oxygen together, these do not account for the properties of water. Yes, you can predict to some extent what the properties would be using quantum chemistry, that if you combine hydrogen and oxygen, certain things will result. But still, the fact remains that water has certain properties that are not the properties of hydrogen and oxygen, whether you can predict it or not. So uh, undermining does not account for emergence. All right, what about the other direction? Undermining upwards, or sorry, mining upwards, which we call overmining. You're talking about what a thing does, all the different possible uses it can have. Um, what's wrong with that is that you cannot account for the fact that the thing is always something over and above all of its current uses or even all of its possible uses. To give an example from Merleau-Ponty, Merleau-Ponty says the house is not the house viewed from nowhere, but the house viewed from everywhere. I think he's wrong about that. The house needs to exist in order for the views to happen. You cannot assemble a house out of views. So that's an undermining gesture there. My favorite living philosopher, Bernard Latour in Paris, uh, is known for actor network theory, which is more common in the social sciences than in philosophy. And what Latour says, a thing is nothing more than whatever it transforms, modifies, perturbs, or creates. A thing is its action, its, its series of actions. Uh, Latour calls himself the only French pragmatist. And in a way, uh, American pragmatism already said this. You need to know what difference a thing makes in order to know whether those qualities are important or not. So undermining and overmining, which often go together in the form of what I call dual mining. So dual mining, an example would be uh, standard scientific materialism which on the one hand tells you that a thing is made up of its ultimate subatomic particles, but then once you get down to those subatomic particles, which is an undermining gesture, you find that those particles are completely mathematically knowable, which is an overmining gesture, because you're saying that you can exhaust the thing through some kind of mathematical formalization. So the bottom and the top levels are both accounted for, but the thing itself, which is in the middle, is not. Uh, Tristan Garcia, a very interesting young French philosopher, can also be considered a dual minor, because uh, Garcia says, a table is the difference between its pieces and its uses. So you look at the pieces that a table is made of, you look at all the things that can be done with it, the table is the difference between those two. It's pretty close to what I'm saying, but I think what's wrong with it is it makes the table hypersensitive in both directions. So that if you change the pieces a little bit, take a few atoms out of the table leg, it's no longer the same table. Or if you move the table one centimeter, the difference has changed, and therefore it's also not the same table. Whereas I say the table is that which is reducible in neither direction. To a certain extent, you can change the physical pieces of the table without changing the table. To a certain extent, you can change the possible uses or the relations of the table also without changing the table. So it's close, but there's also a gulf between those two positions. Speaking of tables, uh, some of you may have seen my essay for Documenta, not, not last year's, but the 2012 Documenta in Kassel. I wrote an essay called The Third Table. What I was talking about there was the famous metaphor of the two tables, which used to be even better known in philosophy, from Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, the great English physicist who is best known for observations of an eclipse that verified Einstein's theory of general relativity by showing that uh, starlight did bend as it came near the sun, just as Einstein's theory predicted. But Eddington is also known for his, his Gifford lectures in Edinburgh, Scotland, where he began by saying, I'm writing my lectures at this table, but it's actually two tables. 
One of the tables is mostly empty space, and it's made up of subatomic particles swarming around. The other table is the practical table that's brown, that had a certain price when I bought it at the store, that bears a certain relation to the other furniture in my living room, and so forth. Um, and he says that you can't really reduce one of those to the other, so we'll always be stuck with the two tables. As a physicist, of course, he prefers the scientific one, but he, he admits that the practical one uh, cannot be uh, eliminated. I say that neither of those two tables is the real table. Um, you don't get the table when you explain it in terms of its small, smaller parts, and you don't get the table when you talk about it in terms of its use. It's somewhere in between those two. And this is what I think, first of all, the arts give us. A painting of a table is not telling us about the subatomic constituents of the table or even the macroscopic constituents of the table. It might be interesting to know what a painting is made of. It might be interesting to know what pigments were used and what, what exactly the background is. Is it canvas or something else? But that's not going to exhaust the painting. If somebody has a painting that they call 97% canvas, 3% pigment, that might be a nice little joke. It might be informative, but that's not really what a painting is qua painting. Uh, likewise, you can't exhaust a painting by knowing the socio-political motivations or effects about that painting. So uh, presumably, if you think of Picasso's Guernica, which of course refers to a specific incident in the Spanish Civil War, presumably uh, that painting has the aesthetic quality to make it relevant 500 years from now when the historical details of the Spanish Civil War are almost completely forgotten, except by a few specialist historians. And we can think of other examples. In, in literature, there's Uncle Tom's Cabin in America, which is deeply intertwined with slavery, and you can't really think of it apart from that. But there, if, it, if it's going to survive as a novel, it has to survive uh, not just on the basis of its sociopolitical claims. There has to be some aesthetic quality to it that is not reducible upward to those claims. Uh, the American philosopher Wilfred Sellers also talks about something similar. He talks about the difference between the scientific image of a thing and the manifest image of a thing. And much like Eddington, he says that the scientific one is somehow more accurate, but we can't get rid of the manifest one. I say that neither of those is the real uh, table. Why not? Because those are both images. The table is not an image. The table is a reality that can give rise to images. The table itself is not constructible from images. So that I've said that art has to do with this third table in between the one that's reduced downward to pieces and the one that's reduced upward to effects. I say the same about philosophy, and that might sound a little more controversial because for the past 400 years, ever since the scientific revolution in Europe, philosophy has wanted to be more like the sciences. It's tried to insist more and more that it's scientific. Um, it's tried to be treated as seriously as the sciences have come to be treated. Now, the problem with that is it doesn't fit very well with the Socratic sense of philosophy. And in a way, I, I would argue that Socrates is the first philosopher in the West. I love the pre-Socratic thinkers, but they're really physicists more than they are uh, philosophers, because they're trying to reduce the thing downward. They're undermining reality down to its ultimate physical elements or down to this shapeless apeiron. I think the first philosophy comes with Socrates and Plato, personally. And you will certainly recall that in Plato's dialogues, Socrates never, although he asks for definitions of everything constantly, never comes up with a successful definition. There's not one dialogue that ends with Socrates saying, aha, we finally found out what virtue is or what friendship is. No, none of these definitions ever work. Uh, the only thing he knows is that he knows nothing. He's never been anyone's teacher and all sorts of similar utterances from Socrates. Only a god has knowledge. Uh, the philosopher is the lover of wisdom, etymologically. The wisdom is not directly obtainable. The thing itself is withdrawn, to use a term from object-oriented ontology. We actually took it from Heidegger, but somehow it's credited to us, even though it's simply borrowed. Uh, the idea that the thing in itself a uh, Kantian term, ultimately, is not directly graspable. It can only be alluded to. And this is important. Sometimes people say that if, if you don't believe direct knowledge is possible, then all you're left with is vague, hand-waving gesticulations, negative theology. That's not really true at all. Uh, even negative theology gives us more than negative theology. Go back and look at Pseudo-Dionysius, the most eminent of the negative theologians in the Middle Ages. There's a beautiful passage where Pseudo-Dionysius tries to explain the Trinity. And he says, think of the Trinity as uh, being like three lamps in one house. There's one light, and you can't tell which part of the light came from which of the three lamps. The light is one, and yet there are three sources. That's the Trinity. Now, even if you don't believe in the Trinity, that's a wonderful metaphor. And it, it isn't just negative. It tells you something. It gives you a grip to allow you to somehow understand what the Trinity might be like in theology. So even in negative theology, there's more positive content. But the other thing is that there is a lot of human cognition that we already acknowledge that 
alludes rather than making the thing directly present. And let's start with wine tasting, something we talked about at breakfast this morning a bit. Uh, Daniel Dennett, who is a wonderfully clear philosopher, but also an extremely reductive one, uh, has an article called Quining Qualia, where he tries to get rid of qualia, those horrible things, according to him. And his example is that of wine tasting. And he talks about a, a wine taster drinking from a glass and saying, a flamboyant and velvety pinot, but lacking in stamina. And his attitude towards this seems to be, what a bunch of pretentious crap. You know, what you really need to do is pour the wine into a machine. The machine will analyze the chemical formula of the wine, and that's real wine tasting. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, my wife is actually a food scientist, and, and they go in both directions, too. They do a chemical analysis. They also do a sensory analysis of wine or whatever other product they're looking at. But this is still the two tables of Eddington. This is still the manifest and scientific image of, of sellers. It's not getting at that third thing that cannot be reduced either to the chemical formula or to the sensory analysis because sensory analysts can be wrong. And so what you need is a master wine taster, a master wine critic who speaks of a flamboyant and velvety pinot but lacking in stamina. And this is why I think that critics in this sense, there are two senses of criticism. One sense of criticism is I know the answer and I'm going to tear everything down to the foundations and explain it in terms of that. So if I am a literary critic, say of a Marxist persuasion, I'll say all of Dickens' plots seem to be about this and this and this, but actually they're all about exploitation and class structure in Victorian England. That explains it all. Um, okay, you can do that with sometimes useful results, but you're not doing justice to Dickens if you do that. There's something in it that cannot be reduced to that. But there's another kind of criticism, and that's when we talk about wine criticism, theater criticism, food criticism, um, uh, architectural criticism, art criticism. These people tend to write like poets. These people tend to allude to what they're talking about. They don't express things formulaically in clear discursive prose terms. The best critics have something very poetic about them. It does run the risk of pretension, sure. Um, but this is the professional risk we run in the humanities. Pretension is our professional risk. It's not the risk the scientists face. You might find a dogmatic scientist, a bullying scientist, a narrow-minded scientist, an arrogant scientist. You're probably not going to find a pretentious scientist because there's nothing in the professional criteria of the sciences that encourages the sort of indirect, elusive language that we have to do in the humanities and the arts in order to get at the thing indirectly. I can give you some other examples of indirect cognition that are well known to be effective. Uh, one of them is, uh, consider the case of threats. And the, probably the most famous example from popular culture is from The Godfather, Marlon Brando's recurring phrase, I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Wonderfully vague threats. If instead he had said, if the guy doesn't give my friend the part in the movie, I'm going to cut off his horse's head and put it in his bed at night while he's sleeping. That's a very grotesque statement, and it's more literal. That's actually what he does to punish the, the Hollywood producer. But it's not nearly as frightening as saying an offer he can't refuse. The, the threat left vague is more powerful. I'll give you one from real life. This is a horrible example, but it's, it's brilliant as a threat. This comes from Dick Cheney during the lead up to the first Gulf War in Iraq in, in 1991. Um, there, was, there was some speculation at the time that Saddam Hussein was planning to use chemical weapons against the American soldiers. Whether true or not, that was the speculation in the media. And as a result, Dick Cheney sent uh, Saddam Hussein this horrible letter, but it's, a, it's great as a threat. The threat was, if Iraq uses chemical weapons against the American soldiers, the United States will respond promptly and decisively in a manner from which it will take Iraq centuries to recover. Now, if he had said it literally, that if you use chemical weapons, we're going to use nuclear weapons, um, that's not an effective threat, because then one can always doubt if you're really going to follow through on that, and th threats that are specified are somehow never as frightening as vague and ominous threats. Uh, the way he wrote it was, was very uh, well done. And more generally, rhetoric, um, which you can think of if you go back and read Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric, rhetoric is the art of the background. It's the art of things that are never explicitly stated. And Aristotle recognizes that this is a more powerful kind of language than direct statement. Uh, the example he gives is that if you're speaking in Greece, in ancient Greece, you can say, and this man has been crowned three times with laurel. You don't have to say, because he has won the Olympic Games three times, because the ancient Greeks all knew that that's what it means when you say this man has been crowned with laurel. It's somehow more powerful, uh, rhetorically, to let, leave a lot unstated. And so there's, there's a certain power to rhetoric that we have lost in contemporary times when we speak of rhetoric as mere rhetoric. Rhetoric is something we dismiss. Uh, 
But the ancients knew better than we did how powerful it is. And this is why they spent so much time learning it, training in it. Aristotle supposedly spent half of the day teaching his students philosophy and the other half teaching rhetoric. So it shows you he knew there, there was something very important there. All right. Um, so these are examples where uh, indirect speech is actually more powerful than indirect speech. Art is another. Uh, I've claimed that philosophy is inherently a similar sort of thing that eludes rather than providing knowledge or information. Now, why is this important to object-oriented ontology, which is the, the school of philosophy I represent? Uh, object-oriented philosophy grew out of an attempt to understand phenomenology and its critique by Heidegger. This was in the 1990s. And I'll, let, let's start with Heidegger, even though he's the later figure. And I'll just give a brief summary here for those of you who are not in philosophy. Phenomenology, as founded by Edmund Husserl in 1900-1901, uh, was primarily geared towards describing things exactly as they appear to us. Instead of accepting theories about the way the world works that aren't immediately evident, we should describe the appearances and all the subtlety they present to us. So if a door slams, instead of giving scientific theories about how the vibrations go through the air and cause your eardrum to vibrate and send chemical signals up your nervous system, which may be true, but these are mediated cognitions. We never see that directly. What we, what we experience directly is that the door slams and I hear these various subtleties of the door slamming and I, I react bodily to that in certain subtle ways that can be described um, in, in, with great nuance. Supposedly Husserl spent a whole semester having his students analyze a mailbox. Uh, whether or not that is true, it, it's conceivably true. Um, one of the things that's easy to learn is one of the first lessons of phenomenology is that when we see people or other objects, we're seeing the front sides. I'm not seeing the back side of any of you. I'm not seeing the internal organs of any of you. Yet I assume you are three-dimensional solid entities rather than simply flat cardboard surfaces. Um, I have no way of knowing that, but I assume that. So there are things that are, are um, implied or entailed by the perceptions we have that aren't actually directly present and so forth. But let's, before we get into Husserl, let's talk about Heidegger's criticism, which is also powerful. Heidegger's criticism is that it's actually fairly rare to encounter things as present in consciousness. And so therefore, phenomenology starts off on the wrong foot. For the most part, we are taking things for granted. Uh, none of you were thinking about the floor in this auditorium, probably, until I mentioned it just now. And yet you were relying on it. You're taking it for granted. If it were not there, you would fall into the basement of the building, become injured or die, perhaps. Um, none of you were thinking about the oxygen in the room, unless you have a breathing difficulty or unless you find it very stuffy. And so there's this, this whole background of, of vague, unthematized realities that we take for granted that are not present to consciousness. And this has led many readers of Heidegger to say that praxis comes before theory, that we're practically using things before we theoretically or visually perceive them. I think that's, that reading doesn't go deep enough. It's very common now, but I think it doesn't go deep enough for the reason that praxis ultimately doesn't get any more deeply at the things than theory does. So if you make a theory about chairs, I don't know if such a thing exists, then you're going to be oversimplifying the chair, you're going to be abstracting from its concrete reality and so forth. But the same is true when you use the chair. When you use the chair, you're also only using a limited range of it. Uh, dogs and mosquitoes can smell things in the chair that you cannot, for example. There might be other properties in the chair uh, that, that you have no access to as a human being. Uh, so really the difference between theory and praxis isn't that big. Uh, despite what many of the interpretations of Heidegger say. Theory and praxis are both relations to the thing. The thing itself exists whether we relate to it or not. This is why object-oriented ontology is a realism. The thing is there. We relate to it, whether theoretically or practically. We are translating the thing into human terms. Uh, what's deeper than theory and praxis is the thing itself. Now, uh, this sounds like a recursion to Kant's thing in itself, and actually it is, with uh, one important difference which is that for object-oriented ontology, the things do this to each other as well. It's not just that we poor tragic humans are haunted by this thing in itself that we can never reach. It's that objects do this to each other as well. To use the example from Islamic philosophy, when fire burns cotton, uh, the fire and the cotton are not making contact with all the properties of each other. It doesn't matter whether they're conscious or not. It's not about consciousness. It's simply about whether relation uh, is able to exhaust all the properties and the things to which it relates. And the answer to that is obviously no. Uh, the fire is not going to interact with all the properties of the cotton and vice versa. The cotton will not interact with all the properties of the fire any more than humans <coughs> can see either cotton or fire directly. So that's the difference from Kant. Um, whereas the German idealist argument, which is the usual way of getting around Kant, is to say, if you think a thing, if you think a thing in itself outside thought, that is already a thought. Uh, 
and therefore you're already trapped in the circle of thoughts and the numen on the thing in itself is an artificial construct that can't really sustain itself in opposition to the mind and so forth. That's not how object-oriented ontology does it. Object-oriented ontology says there was a great crossroads in philosophy at that time. After Kant, what could have happened? Instead of German idealism, you could have had German realism. And this was quite conceivable because you had Leibniz and Wolff who were very interested in non-human entities in a way that, that Kant was not. Uh, you could have said, in other words, whereas the German idealists said, Kant was a great genius except for this stupid thing about the thing in itself. We can get rid of that by saying that it's already a form of thought. Instead of that, they could have said Kant was a genius precisely on this question of the thing in itself, uh, except that he shouldn't have restricted it to human experience and say, we poor humans are the only ones who can't get at it. And seen it, this is characteristic of inanimate relations as well. We would have had a very different 19th century in many ways. Not only would German philosophy have been different, we would have had something instead of Marx, we would have had something instead of all, all sorts of figures that came afterwards as a result of what happened with Hegel and his contemporaries. In any case, um, that's so much for Heidegger for this talk. Heidegger is the one who talks about objects that are deeper than any access to them, whether it's theoretical or practical. That's my interpretation. It's not widely accepted. Uh, people still want to make that big gap between the theoretical and the practical. I don't see that as a big gap. Theoretical and practical are both human ways of relating to the worlds. The world itself is there apart from any of our relations to it. And we can get there by alluding to it. We can allude to that thing in itself behind any access. We can't talk about it directly, but we can speak about it indirectly. And aesthetics is one great way of doing this. All right. So that's Heidegger. I want to say something about Husserl, though, because Husserl shouldn't exist just to be as a scarecrow, a straw man to be knocked over by Heidegger. There's something very important going on in Husserl that his, his admirers don't even usually see, and it is as follows. What did British empiricism in the uh, 1700s tell us, or late 1600s and 1700s, tell us about objects? British empiricism likes to say that objects don't really exist. What exists are bundles of qualities. So in David Hume's favorite example, um, there's not really an apple in my hand. What's in my hand is red, spherical, juicy, hard, cold, sweet, all of these qualities that you ascribe to the apple that seem to come together often enough as a matter of habits, as a matter of customary conjunction, that uh, I sort of arbitrarily give all those qualities the nickname apple. But there's not really a thing called an apple over and above all those qualities. They're simply all those qualities that are pasted together often enough that I just kind of give them a collective name. Well, in a way, uh, Husserl's greatest service to philosophy is to deny that from step one. For Husserl and for all phenomenologists, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre, whoever, uh, the object comes first. The object comes before the qualities. Very important reversal of British empiricism. Why? Well, there are two ways you can, at least two ways you can see this. The way Husserl likes to talk about it is that you can take this apple and rotate it in your hand. And as you do so, you're seeing different qualities at different instants of this apple. Yet you never think to yourself, all right, this apple is now 97.6% similar to the one I saw two seconds ago, and therefore I will arbitrarily declare through family resemblance that it is the same apple. No, what happens is you say, I'm turning this apple in my head and I'm seeing different qualities. Now, this is very interesting because it means that there is a tension between an object and its own qualities. An object is not just a bundle of qualities. The object displays certain qualities, those qualities are changing, and yet they don't change enough most of the time to make you think, oh, it's not an apple, it's, it's a peach, or it's, it's something else. The object is there. The object remains constant, even as I'm seeing different abschattungen, or adumbrations of it, as we say in English. So uh, that's the Husserlian way of looking at it. Merleau-Ponty, as usual, has an even more beautiful way of describing it. He gives us some of the, the finest sentences in 20th century philosophy. Merleau-Ponty says somewhere, I think in Phenomenology of Perception, that the black of an ink pen and the black of an executioner's hood are not the same black, even if it's exactly the same wavelength of light. And you can see why. The black of, the black of an ink pen is inflected by the object to which it belongs, a harmless black ink pen that you can use to write happy messages or poems, whereas the black of the executioner's hood is associated with death and destruction and perversions of justice, or whatever else you want to associate it with. So the, the object always comes first for phenomenologists, not the qualities. Now here's the next interesting point in Husserl that has not been seen by most of his commentators. There are actually two kinds of qualities. Because on the one hand, the qualities we see with the senses are accidental. I'm turning the apple in my hand and the qualities are changing constantly and it doesn't matter. 
still the same apple. And yet, what is phenomenology really about in the end? It's about analyzing that apple and asking yourself, what is the essence of this apple? That is, what are the qualities this apple needs to have always in order for me to recognize it as this apple and not as another apple and not as a peach, not as a pineapple or as a grapefruit? This is what phenomenological analysis, eidetic analysis is all about in phenomenology. Varying the possible appearances of that thing in your mind to such an extent that you can finally realize which ones are expendable, which qualities don't matter, and which qualities are absolutely essential. Now, what Husserl ends up deciding that you can get the essential ones with your mind and you get the unessential ones with your senses. And again, I think this is wrong. I think the mind is inevitably going to distort the things as much as the senses do. Um, and Heidegger saw this. Heidegger saw that theoretical comportment towards the things is not going to get them directly. There's always going to be something withdrawn in the thing, a kind of substance you can't get at. But it's still a very important fact that you have objects for Husserl, which are phenomenal objects. I call them sensual objects. He actually calls them intentional objects, a term I don't like for a number of reasons. I call them sensual objects. The sensual object is intention with its qualities, but it has two separate kinds of qualities. It has the sensual qualities that change from second to second, and it doesn't matter. It also has those essential ones that are real, that it needs in order to be what it is, and they're submerged. And unlike Husserl, I don't think your mind will get you there. I think you have to allude to it through aesthetic means and other means. Whereas the object that Heidegger is talking about is a real submerged hidden object. It's a withdrawn object. It's, it's deeper than any possible perception. Husserl's object is not. I can take the apple in my hand and there it is. It's the same apple no matter which way I turn it. There's nothing hidden about it at all. It's right there in front of me. If anything, it's just encrusted with accidental features that don't really belong to it and that I have to analyze away. So what we end up with in object-oriented ontology, some of you, may, I know some of you have read The Quadruple Object, that book from seven years ago, um, is that there are two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. And all four of them exist in tension with each other. Objects both have and do not have their qualities. And all objects, whether they're real or sensual, have real qualities and sensual qualities. And in that book, I try to d derive time and space as well as what I call essence and ados. Uh, from the tensions between the object, the two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. I won't get into that today because it's a little technical, but you can look at that book if you if you want. It exists in English and German. Um, should be easily obtainable in both languages. So uh, people often say object-oriented ontology is about hidden objects that you can't get at. Yeah, that's part of it. But what object-oriented ontology is really about, it's really about the tension between objects and their own qualities. And that's what becomes interesting for aesthetics. And let me give you an example uh, by starting with metaphor, even though it doesn't belong to the realm of painting. Painting has other techniques, but let's look at metaphor. Let's look at Homer's most famous metaphor from the Iliad, the wine dark sea, referring to the Mediterranean. All right, well, what makes this a metaphorical statement? Let's look at a statement that is not metaphorical. <clears throat> like um, a pen is like a pencil. We don't normally think of that as a metaphorical statement unless some absolute master Dadaist is setting it up in just the right way in a poem. A pen is like a pencil. What, why is a pen is like a pencil not a metaphorical statement in most cases? Because we are simply claiming that those two have identical qualities. Pen writes, a pencil writes, the writing's a little different, but they both write. That, that is my definition of a literal statement. A literal statement is one in which you are simply comparing the qualities of two things and saying that they are similar. Um, a pen is like a pencil doesn't work, but also a statement that is too bizarre does not work as a metaphor. So if you, one example I heard once in graduate school, drinking a milkshake is like drawing an isosceles triangle. Again, a master poet might be able to make this work, surrealist, surrealist poet perhaps, but um, it doesn't really work as a metaphor for most of us because the connection is too oblique. We have a hard time making that work in our minds. What about Wine Dark Sea, however? Wine Dark Sea is a good one. It's one of the classics in Western literature, um, even though it's fairly simple. And what makes it initially plausible is the fact that you see the wine and the sea are both dark. That's what the metaphor seems to be saying. But the metaphor is doing more than that, right? The metaphor is using that literal resemblance in the color between the, the Aegean Sea and the wine as a pretext for implying much more of a similarity than that. So the wine dark sea, when you say that, you're giving the sea some of the other properties of wine, such as drunkenness, oblivion, danger, all the other things you might associate with wine. 
Uh, and so that, that literal similarity of the color is just the first step. You're actually ascribing this being, all these other wine features, to the sea itself. There's something else about metaphors that is not true of literal statements. This is very interesting. I, I can say a pen is like a pencil. I can also say a pencil is like a pen. There's not really any difference, is there? It doesn't matter which order I mention them in. But what if I change wine dark sea into sea dark wine? Homer never does that. But let's say we, he talked about the sea dark wine. That's a totally different metaphor. It's also a metaphor, but it's a completely different one. In this case, the wine is the subject, and it's taking sea qualities, maybe adventure, depth, uh, whatever. We could brainstorm and come up with some other possible features that are at work there. So metaphors are irreversible. They're also not literal. And the irreversibility means that one term plays the subject role, the other term plays the qualities role. In the case of wine dark sea, it's the sea that's the object, the wine dark qualities are applied to it. And this leads to a further interesting uh, implication. Uh, when you talk about wine dark sea, we can't really imagine a sea with wine qualities. The metaphor asks us to do that. We, we cannot really imagine a sea that has all these wine qualities, even though they seem to have some in common. And so the sea in that case becomes what I call a withdrawn real object. It's not accessible. It's like Heidegger's tools that withdraw behind all of their possible effects. Uh, you cannot get at that sea. The sea becomes a real object, and that's a problem, because I think phenomenology is correct that objects and qualities always come as a pair. You can't have a featureless object, and you can't have qualities that are not attached to some object as the satellites. So what happens? What actually happens in the metaphor? How can we have a metaphor if the sea disappears and all we have left is the wine dark qualities? And this led me to a, a discovery that seemed bizarre at first, but I've become more committed to it with every passing year, and that is that there's only one object left on the scene that can play the role of that missing C object and take on the wine qualities, and that is I myself as the reader. I myself perform the missing C, performing the wine qualities. All art is theatrical for this reason. You cannot, I'm gonna talk about Michael Fried in a second, and of course Michael Fried thinks theater is the ruin of art. I'm gonna say exactly the opposite, that theater is the primordial art. I would go so far as to hypothesize that the mask was the first artwork in human history. We'll never know because masks are usually made of perishable materials that degenerate quickly, whereas paintings can survive, of course, in caves. But I suspect that paintings uh, are not as old as masks. And I have some anecdotal evidence for this, which is, first of all, if you consider how children relate to masks, children believe they are transformed when they wear a mask. They really believe they are Spider-Man or that someone else is a, a wild pig or whatever mask you're wearing. And I've had the experience of being able to frighten animals with a mask without meaning to. My parents' dogs were horrified of this terrible zebra mask I bought from Tanzania for my Halloween costume. It looked like a zebra that had risen from the dead. There were these smoky patches around the eyes. My parents had a terrier and a black lab, and the terrier was terrified by my zebra mask, and the black lab jumped up from the side and knocked it off my face. They were, they were horrified by this mask, even though they know me very well. Somehow this, having this zebra head on made me a terrifying, you know, shaman-like organism. In any case, uh, for object-oriented ontology, art is always theatrical because it is always the beholder, always the person experiencing the artwork who has to stand in for the missing real object that withdraws from any direct cognitive perceptual access. Art invokes real objects in a way that knowledge does not. This is what gives it a higher emotional charge than most knowledge, the fact that we have to actually enter into the artwork and, and perform the missing object. All right, so let me talk briefly about Kant here, because there, uh, I should say that object-oriented ontology is known for the phrase that aesthetics is first philosophy, and this is what we mean. Aesthetics is generally, for object-oriented ontology, about driving wedges between objects and their own qualities, taking advantage of the fact that objects and their own qualities are never quite overlapping, never quite, the fact that objects can exchange qualities, the fact that they are something more than a mere set of qualities. Uh, this is why triple O, as we call it, says aesthetics is first philosophy. Now, uh, Kant is an interesting uh, forerunner here again. Um, I don't have to explain this in Germany, of course, um, that philosophy being one of the slowest moving fields, there's still a sense in which Kant is a contemporary philosopher. We are still living in his shadow. There are many ways in which Kant has not been overcome in all three parts of his philosophy, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, the critique of judgment. Uh, there are many attempts to get around Kant's formulations of these problems, but he is still really the, the master uh, of philosophy, I would say, in 2018. It's only been 200 and 
30 some years, but that's, that's a short period in the history of philosophy compared to any other profession, painting or architecture or certainly engineering. All right, so what goes on in the critique of judgment? A lot of things go on in Kant's critique of judgment, but let's just focus on a few of them. First of all, the fact that for Kant's aesthetic experience uh, cannot be replaced by any sort of conceptual language or by criteria or by rules. It simply has to be experienced directly by taste. You cannot paraphrase beauty. You cannot paraphrase it in terms of prose sentences. Speaking of beauty, I'm one of those who are in favor of restoring this word to the arts. I, I know most artists won't be caught dead talking about beauty. Zizek makes a very funny remark, which is that it's not artists who talk about beauty anymore, it's scientists. Right? Read any popular book of string theory, and you know Bryant Greene will be talking about the elegance of this theory and the beauty of the theory, the mathematical wonders of it, and what it tells us about the cosmos. You're not going to find artists talking about that, right? You're going to find artists doing things like putting a bit of cow carcass and luring flies to come and be electrocuted so that they can display the brute trauma of the real, right? This, this is something that fits with more with what most artists are doing now, not beauty. Now you'd be laughed at as some kind of you know, poseur at best, I think, if you were saying, my paintings are so beautiful, um, which I think is too bad. I think beauty is a real phenomenon, and Triple O defines beauty as the separation between an object and its qualities. This is when aesthetic uh, experience occurs, and actually we think that cause and effect on the inanimate level happens as a variant of aesthetic experience as well, but more on that some other day. Uh, beauty is about the separation of an object from its qualities. This is when you have an experience of something like the beautiful. So that's one thing about Kant uh, that I totally accept. The, the fact that you cannot translate beauty into any prose terms, rules, criteria, they simply have, has, has to be experienced. Um, one thing I would not agree with is, you know, of course, Kant also makes beauty occur totally on the human side of the equation, not on the work side. When we're talking about beauty, we're not talking about the object for Kant, we're talking about the universal, the, the, the transcendental faculty of judgment that all humans share. So it's about us. Beauty is really in the eye of the beholder for Kant. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried in a minute, because they are, in some ways, Kant's leading heirs in the 20th century, at least in visual arts criticism. And it's interesting that, that uh, Fried and Greenberg simply flip that around. They want to get the human element out of it. They want it to be all on the object side. But they're still assuming that this side and that side should not be mixing, that that's a special gap we should not try to cross. It's always on one side or on the other side. It's either on the side of our faculty of judgment or it's on the side of the object. The latter is what Fried and, and Greenberg will say. Okay, and there's another issue that has to do with the sublime. I am inclined to say that the sublime does not exist, which I know might be shocking. You know, there, of course, are two kinds of the sublime in Kant, the mathematical and the dynamical, one having to do with the absolute size of a thing, you know, the starry sky, the vast sea. As long as it's not in direct position to harm us, we can experience it as the sublime for Kant. The dynamical being absolute power, uh, the tsunami, a nuclear test, um, the collision of an asteroid with the Earth, perhaps, uh, that would be the dynamical kind of the sublime. Now, it's interesting that Kant also puts the sublime on the human side of the equation. Even though you think the sublime would be an example of absolute otherness, which is, which is how the French theorists like Lyotard treat it. Um, in a way, Kant thinks it's about us too, because it's about our finitude and how much we are overwhelmed by all these sublime things. Now, the reason I am uh, skeptical of the existence of this sublime is that I don't think the experience of the sublime is ever absolute. I think we always have a sense of particularity in these cases, I think we have a, some vague sense of magnitude. Uh, Timothy Morton, in his book Hyperobjects, writes about how, by hyperobjects, he means objects that are massively distributed in space and time well beyond the human scale. So, for example, the decay of radioactive waste, or how long the CO2 is going to remain in the atmosphere from our factories, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of years in some cases. These are hyperobjects. And what's interesting about them is that for Morton, they're not infinite. Morton makes a very interesting case that infinity is somehow less threatening than very large finite numbers. If you think about infinity, it makes you feel important. It makes you feel like, wow, I'm, I'm conceiving of infinity. Look at this infinite sky I'm looking at. No, it's actually the sky has a certain size. It's been calculated by astronomers. Uh, the uh, radioactive waste that we produce will decay to safe levels someday. It's just a very, very long time from now, hundreds of thousands of years. That's somehow more threatening than this infinite absolute other. And so I would replace the term sublime with the hyperobjective, because every experience of the sublime is different. Therefore, it's not an absolute uh, size or power. 
but that's a that's a sidelight here. Now, uh, what uh, formalism? I want to talk about formalism, and formalism is one of those words like realism. Did I, by the way, tell me, did I start at five thirty? Do you know? I've got your watch here, but I don't remember what time it was when I started. Five fifteen. Okay, so I've gone about forty-five minutes already. I'll try to start wrapping it up. Um, formalism. What do we really mean by formalism? It means all kinds of things. And Greenberg and Freed deny being formalists at all. Uh, they define that term in their own ways. Formalism, like realism, can mean different things in different fields and in different authors. Here's how I would define formalism. I think we have to go back to Kant again. And as I recall, the only place he actually uses that term is in his ethical theory. He he does speak of formalism and ethics. And what he says is that formalism and ethics means that an ethical action is autonomous. It's not heteronomous. It's not done for some purpose other than ethical purposes, right? It's not that I'm good because I'm afraid of going to hell or because I want a good reputation as a citizen in the city or because I want people to like me or because I want to sleep well at night with a clean conscience. Uh, these may, be ab- may have admirable results, but they are not ethical actions. To be an ethical action, an action must be performed solely for its own sake, solely for duty, and so forth. This is the easiest place to see what formalism means in Kant. It means autonomy, the autonomy of the ethical sphere from all non-ethical considerations. Well, you can make an analogous case uh, about the critique of, of judgment, because what Kant is most concerned to distinguish beauty from there is the agreeable. Right? The fact that something makes me feel good does not make it beautiful. Um, the example I always use, is I'm from Iowa, which people in America make a lot of jokes about Iowa as being this uneducated backwater filled with, you know, it's not really true, but um, we, we get kind of sensitive about that, that Iowa is usually the first state people pick to make that case. And so there's this film Field of Dreams you may have seen. It's just kind of a charming Hollywood film about old baseball players coming back to life and uh, Kevin Costner plays a game with them and their ghosts and so forth. And that's, that was actually filmed in Iowa and the field is still there, not far from where I live now, you know, 20 minutes maybe. Now, what if I were to make the case that Field of Dreams is the greatest film ever produced? Now, that would be obviously be ridiculous. You know, it's a, probably not even a top 100. It's just a charming Hollywood summer film with a big star in it. Uh, I, I have to abstract from the agreeableness of an Iowa film to me, right, in order to... Um, truly judge whether it's a beautiful film or not. I, I can't be influenced by personal considerations of agreeableness. Um, so that's the sense in which art is formalistic. But there's another sense of formalism in Kant that I think is less justifiable. Uh, not only is the artwork supposed to be autonomous from any non-aesthetic considerations, but the, the human and the object are supposed to be autonomous from each other. This is really the modern gesture par excellence in philosophy. It starts with Descartes. Kant perfects it, but it starts with Descartes. This idea that there are two basic kinds of things. One, humans. Two, everything else. Think of all the different kinds of entities there are in the universe. Well, they all go into this basket, and humans are here. Humans are so special that everything else goes over here. Dolphins, protons, comets, comic books, everything else goes over here. Um... And I'm going to say in a second that this is problematic when Fried and Greenberg retain this idea for reasons I'm going to mention. But I want to get to Fried and Greenberg so we can talk a little about painting. Um, I'm going to start with Fried in reverse chronological order. Fried, who began as a disciple of Clement Greenberg, they had a falling out. And you probably know Fried's famous 1967 article, Art and Objecthood. And by the way, he means object in the opposite sense that I do. For Fried, object is a physical obstacle in the room that it's simply there, and what you see is what you get, and it's a literal object. For object-oriented ontology, the object is that which hides, that which is never directly accessible. So it's simply the opposite meaning of the term. And the reason I do that is some people ask, why don't I distinguish between object and thing? The reason is that I, I came out of phenomenology, and, and in phenomenology, which is originally an Austrian school, people like Brentano and, and Meinong and Husserl talk about object as the broadest possible term to refer to anything, existing or non-existing. So I've simply kept their their usage rather than Heidegger's usage, which is that object is a bad and thing is good. Anyway, um, Fried argues, he claims that the minimalists, as many of you know, are not, it's, it's the ruin of all arts. They're simply producing literal objects. They're producing white cubes and wooden rods and brass frames on the wall and, and so forth. This is literal. Fried also says that it's theatrical. And he tends to treat those two as the same, roughly the same term. I think they're opposites for reasons I'll explain. Uh, 
how can he claim that the minimalist works are theatrical? Well, because there's no real depth to the works. What you see is what you get. They're just literal objects. And therefore, the only possible use for them is to provoke some kind of reaction out of us, the beholders in the, in the space. Uh, it's meant to jar us in some way or get a reaction out of us. So that's theater. All right. Now, I actually think that the literal and the theatrical are opposites. And what I said about metaphor should explain why. Because what I said about metaphor is that because the real object disappears, we have to stand in for it. We have to perform the artwork. It's a kind of method acting. Stanislavski's method acting, the great Russian uh, thespian. That you have to perform what it is. You know, in America, they call it the, the method. They call it the system in Russia. Uh, Stanislavski called it the system. We call it the method, and a lot of Hollywood actors follow it. And as you may know, it involves really trying to be that character while you're shooting the movie. So Marlon Brando and On the Waterfront was playing this tough union guy on the waterfront uh, and he was doing things like climbing up ropes using only his arm strength in order to get these big bulky arms during the film and trying to get into the mindset of the character and so forth Uh, that would be theater in the sense that I'm talking about now Freed after this essay within a few years was switching to art history as you probably also know he went and did this famous trilogy on French painting and he found in Denis Diderot the French philosopher an ally in his anti-theatrical approach to art. And he, he goes and talks about a number of famous French painters in the 18th century, such as Greuze and Chardin, who seem to paint figures in the paintings that seem absorbed in what they're doing and therefore paying no attention to us at all. So there's a boy blowing a soap bubble, or there's another boy building a house of cards, and he even takes a desk drawer and pulls it out towards us as if to separate us from the painting. All these paintings that Diderot approves of, trying to show us that they don't care that we're there watching them. They're not even noticing us. This is absorption, and it's anti-theatrical for Freed. All right, he does a nice job of showing this, and Diderot is indeed his ally. However, problems already appear in the first book of that trilogy. Um, Jacques-Louis David, for example, when he paints the Oath of the Horatii, where the four guys are swearing an oath and the women are crying on the other side, it looks at first like this is an anti-theatrical painting because everyone is absorbed in, what, in their own emotion. And yet within about 10 years, it starts to look incredibly theatrical. Right? The poses look incredibly artificial. The emotion seems overdone. And David realizes this. And so he paints uh, that painting of the Sabines, the war painting, where everyone seems to be frozen in an instant in poses. And in another 10 years, he thinks that looks theatrical. And so it's becoming harder and harder to guarantee pictorial effects that are not theatrical, that look absorbed in their own actions that don't seem to be paying any attention to us. And then this problem continues further. Uh, uh, Millet, who paints peasants in early 19th century France, uh, his, he was a very polarizing artist because his fans say, look at how non-theatrical, look at, look at how absorbed all these peasants are in their labors. And there's another camp that says, no, this is completely artificial. It's completely contrived. These are not natural poses by the peasants at all. So Millet is actually a, a fake. Then it gets to the point where in Manet, this is the culmination of Freed's trilogy, of course, his book on Manet, this idea that Manet realizes that Diderot's tradition doesn't work anymore. You, you cannot have an absorbed uh, paint picture in which the figures are all absorbed with each other and what they're doing, they do not take the beholder into account. Even as early as the first book in the trilogy, he said the idea that the beholder is not there is a supreme fiction. That's where it comes from in my, my title. Uh, because obviously there has to be a beholder. Obviously, a painting is there for someone to look at it. But these absorptive paintings heroically try to pretend that there is no beholder. And then in Manet's case, and this is why Freed thinks Manet is the first modern painter, different reason from Greenberg, he thinks it's because Manet realizes that this is no longer going to work, uh, that, you, that there's always one central figure in Manet's great paintings who's looking right at the beholder, you know, Olympia or Dejeuner sur l'Herbe. They're, they're challenging the beholder by looking right at them. And beyond that, uh, Freed says that every portion of the canvas surface seems to be looking right at us, which is why it looks flat. He thinks the flatness is derivative of the concession to theatricality, that the entire painting is, is right there in our face in Manet. So it's interesting, like, like most important thinkers, Freed is able to see that his initial principle is an oversimplification. He starts as an anti-theatrical critic, and then he starts to realize that many concessions to theater have to be made for painting to work. So... Uh, what I want to do with Freed is to say that theater is a necessary part of any art because of what I said about uh, metaphor at the beginning, that there's no aesthetic effect unless the, the object disappears. And if the object disappears, we, the beholder, are going to step into its place and perform the labor of bringing that artwork to life. All right. Now, as for Greenberg, there's something else going on there. 
Greenberg, who came before Freed, of course. For Greenberg, it's all about flatness. Greenberg is, of course, interested in the way that uh, ever since the Italian Renaissance, Western art has been trying to perfect the, the tradition of pictorial illusionism. It looks like you're looking out a window into three-dimensional space and everything is positioned to look like a real scene. Uh, for various reasons, of course, Greenberg thinks this becomes impossible in the 19th century. It starts turning into kitsch. And he thinks avant-garde painters resist this using various techniques in order to try to maintain the same level of quality as the old masters in order not to fall into kitsch. Well, the real hero of his story, his favorite art movement of the 20th century, is the analytic cubism of Picasso and Brock, which he praises for creating the flattest art in the West since Byzantine times, where you have all the planes of a thing, all the possible views of a thing pasted onto the same surface. Now, it's very interesting to look at who he doesn't like, which contemporary painters early in his career did Greenberg think were going in the wrong direction? Two in particular, among uh, famous painters. First being Dali, and that's, that's not hard to see because uh, what Greenberg objects to in the case of Salvador Dali is the fact that yes, there's all this weird content, there's all these flaming giraffes and melting watches and long-legged ghosts of Vermeer and all these other uh, strange figures in the paintings. And yet what he's doing is still 19th century academic illusionism, three-dimensional painting that looks like real objects positioned in space. Mm -hmm. And so that's by definition academic arts. And uh, Fried has an inter uh, sorry, Greenberg has an interesting definition of academic arts. He says it is art that is unaware of its medium. Art that is unaware of its medium. Fascinating definition. Art that is too focused on its content and unaware of the background conditions that it must draw on is what he calls academic. And parenthetically, there are two other 20th century thinkers who make the same point. Those are Heidegger and Marshall McLuhan. Uh, what does Heidegger hate? Heidegger hates beings. Heidegger hates this these beings that are simply present to consciousness, uh, and there are many of them. What's important to Heidegger is the being that hides behind them all. What about Marshall McLuhan? Marshall McLuhan is the one who said the medium is the message. What does he mean by that? He means you're wasting your time if you argue over which television shows are good or bad or good influences on children. What's important is that television changes consciousness in a way that radio did not, that each medium has its own character and the content is irrelevant. McLuhan even said, uh, the content of a medium is no more relevant than the graffiti on an atomic bomb, which is probably an exaggeration, but it's a striking phrase. Um, okay, so I've already mentioned why Greenberg doesn't like Dali, right? Because Dali uh, simply does 19th century realistic painting with weird objects in it. So it's not really coming to terms with the medium. It's academic. Okay, what about Kandinsky? He wrote a very cruel obituary for Kandinsky just a couple of weeks after the poor guy died where he says, okay, Kandinsky isn't really an academic artist. He's a provincial artist. Okay, how is he provincial? Usually by provincial, we mean somebody who lives in a, in a backwater town and paints on Sunday and isn't really in contact with advanced art. It's just a hobby. We call them, they're, they're not aware of what's going on in the major urban centers of art. That's how we usually use the word provincial. But Greenberg rather cruelly states that there's another kind of provincial. That is a provincial who's right there in the thick of the action and who seems to be a part of the movement but who doesn't really get what it's all about. And he says, that's the problem with Kandinsky's relation to cubism. He doesn't really understand cubism. Why not? Kandinsky thinks cubism is about abstraction. When really, according to Greenberg, it's about flatness. And so what does Kandinsky do? He assembles all these abstract shapes, but they seem to be floating in this vague three-dimensional space. And it creates this illusion of academic space from 19th century realist painting. And so Kandinsky never really overcomes it. And he says, therefore, Kandinsky is a dangerous example to the younger painters. They should avoid his influence if at all possible. Okay, but here's the funny thing. I mentioned that Freed ultimately has to admit that theatricality must be accounted for, even though he's against it. Greenberg, being another important thinker, does exactly the same. Uh, later in his career, he starts to realize that flatness will not work. For example, he realizes that Pollock... Pollock's paintings are not really flat, right? Because there's a kind of optical illusionism. When you go up close and look at one, there's a kind of vague three-dimensionality to the swirls of paint. It looks like they're happening in space. But even more importantly, he says this was already happening with collage, which he credits Brock with rather than Picasso. He goes back to about 1910 and says that's when, the, when Brock and Picasso started to realize they were in danger of flattening the canvas out too much, that there was almost no difference left between the literal canvas surface and the painted surface. And this is why they started trying to find a new and clever way to recreate a sort of three-dimensionality. And they do this by uh, 
um, you know, putting a, the painting of a nail casting a shadow up in one corner, or they put, paint a little loop of rope, or at some point Brock starts putting letters on the canvas, which creates an illusion of several different layers in the painting, or um, actually pasting imitation grain wood paper onto the, the canvas surface. And what ends up happening uh, in this collage period of the Cubist, which Greenberg thinks is extremely important, is that the one flat background that he was always talking about becomes anywhere from four to six different backgrounds. That this, this strange interchange of places between the images and the painting happens. Now, that is a step forward for Greenberg. However, I think there's still a problem. The problem is the background for Greenberg, even if there's five or six backgrounds rather than just one, thanks to Collage and the Cubist, there's still a, the, the depth always comes from a plane. It's never in the content itself. So the individual figures in the painting always have a secondary role for Greenberg, even, even after he rethinks this thing about flatness. And again, this is reminiscent of Heidegger's problem. Uh, Heidegger, you may know, wrote a very important essay, The Origin of the Work of Art, in which he talks about art as the strife between earth and worlds. And it's actually a pretty nice essay. It's aged very well. <clears throat> um, not too many philosophers have written things that can stand up with it, I think. However, there's a big problem with it, which is that the earth, much like Greenberg's flat canvas background, is treated as one. Multiplicity belongs to the surface, to the superficial. The depth belongs to the oneness, the unity of being. It's only in beings, these superficial ontic things, as he calls them, that we get plurality. And so uh, I guess I'm about done here, but that's fine, because I wanted to close with by saying that I think some form of formalism is important. We need autonomy. It doesn't mean that any content, any political or social content has to be excluded. Even if you have a socio-political painting that works, and there's many of them, you're not including all the aspects of your environment in it, right? The painting has firewalls. It allows certain aspects of the environment in it. It doesn't allow all of them in. Otherwise, there'd be just a holistic free-for-all where everything is everything else and everything's mirroring everything which is not how it works even with global warming. Even with global warming, there are certain specific mechanisms that have bad feedback with each other. It's not that every time you spit on the sidewalk, the temperature is rising. Uh, one of Trump's idiot uh, Congress, congressional supporters says the reason the sea levels are rising is because people are throwing stones in the ocean. Did you see that? How stupid can, can we get? Um, yeah, and the Washington Post did a study of how many stones we'd have to throw in the ocean to account for the sea level rises. It was hilarious. Every year, we would have to clear off the top five inches of the United States and dump it in the ocean. Every year. Top five inches of the whole country, dump it in the ocean. Anyway, um, so throw as many stones as you want in the ocean. It's not going to holistically change the climate in any discernible fashion. There are certain feedback mechanisms. In any case, what's important about formalism is the idea that everything is not everything else. Right? that uh, you can take a painting or a play and move it across space and time to some extent, and it's still the same thing. You can produce Shakespeare in Belarus with a different title, and it, it still has a kind of Shakespearean effect. Same with paintings. So um, that's the important part of formalism. The part of formalism that is, is not so good is the kind that Fried and Greenberg take too quickly from Kant. The idea that the, the beholder and the painting must be absolutely separated. Theater must be excluded, as in Fried's interpretation of absorptive paintings. And this is, of course, what makes uh, Fried and Greenberg unable to appreciate any of the developments in post-1960s art. Uh, people such as Boyce, who Greenberg said is simply boring. Um, I'm not sure that Greenberg, looking at Boyce, would say that he's simply boring. I think it's that Greenberg's theory does not allow for something like Boyce, the performative aspect of Boyce's work. Um, or, or even Warhol or um, Bruce Nauman. It, it should not be the case that art that has a human ingredient should be excluded from the field of genuine formalist arts, the way Fried and Greenberg want to do it, because art is always already theatrical, as I tried to argue in the case on metaphor. I'll stop there. Thank you for your patience. Thank you.